<clears throat> I'm Barış. I usually go with my with my middle name. I'm from Intel. Uh, on I'm, I'm here on behalf of the application debugger team. So the topic today is debugging Intel GPUs with GDB. Um, let's begin with the big problem first. Modern compute workload is diverse. So there are engineers, developers, they write applications in a wide range of domains like AI, graphics, fluid dynamics, economic modeling, etc. And they, they want their applications to be optimized for, I mean, to run faster, to be scalable, and to be power efficient. This requires that they, they need to target a variety of hardware coming from uh, various vendors. And also they need to use um, a wide range of software, like libraries, tools, etc., so that they can achieve the performance that they want. Um, Intel One API is, is an initiative um, that aims to provide the, the, the programmers with a unified model so that they can, um, they can get towards this goal. Um, it, so there, there are various toolkits um, in One API releases. So this is a big picture of the, the, the base toolkit. It contains um, compilers, some uh, tools for, for API-based programming, and also analyzers. Um, and with these, programmers can write applications that target CPUs, GPUs, or FEGAs. But today, um, what's important, I mean, what's, what's, uh, what we will be focusing on is that they write programs, um, they compile it with, an, uh, 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 with a compiler that supports such a model, and then they execute their programs on GPUs. And then they will be able to debug it with, uh, with the GDB. Um, let's begin with, um, with this programming model uh, called Sickle. Um, sometimes this is, I mean, Intel sometimes uh, uh, names this as data parallel C++. This is an abstraction layer on top of C++ 17, and it supports data parallelism and heterogeneous programming. The idea here is that uh, programmers can write code, and then they can reuse it in order to offload their, their, um, their computation to uh, various kinds of architectures, uh, and not necessarily uh, only Intel. I mean, it can be, it can be targeting um, uh, um, hardware from other vendors as well. To give an example of how SQL looks like, um, I will use a very simple application, uh, Vector Edition. This is a toy. Sample, of course, um, it's an embarrassing the parallel program actually. So we have two arrays of inputs, and we want to uh, 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 add the elements pairwise and obtain the output. So how would we write it if we were to do it sequentially? The most obvious um, approach is to write this for loop. Um, but in this example, I deliberately abstracted out the body of the for loop. Uh, you see it on the right-hand side as this function called process. The mental model here is that there is this index i, and based on that index i, we are going to process our data. In this case, we read from input one, read from input two, and combine them in some meaningful way, and then write back to the output. Yeah. If I were to execute this, what would happen is my thread would, I mean, the single threaded sequential, so we would process the elements one by one sequentially. Um, here's how it would look like um, in SQL. We would first create a queue. So this queue is basically a container where we'll be submitting jobs and the SQL runtime takes those jobs and it's, uh, it distributes them um, among the threads and it handles scheduling. What we want is that we are now submitting a, a task um, 
to be run in parallel to this queue. And the task is specified by a lambda. The lambda takes i as the parameter and that specifies the index of the, uh, um, of the element, of the data item that we would be processing. And what we do in the body is, is basically exactly the same. Okay, we are processing input and producing output. One way to, and, and uh, what we have inside um, uh, the lambda here is uh, usually called the kernel. I mean, not to be confused with, with the Linux kernel, but it's the computation kernel. A possible execution scenario is that the, the SQL runtime is going to split the data, uh, which is usually very large, into chunks, and then it can assign each chunk to a thread. And when executed, one possible way is that the thread is going to take its it's assigned range and it's going to process it sequentially. Or in another model, the data could be vectorized and now the thread and threads are still assigned uh, uh, to, to a range of data, uh, but what they can do is that by means of vectorization, they actually process the data also uh, in parallel. And this is the uh, single SIMD model, single instruction, multiple data, and that's how uh, basically GPUs work. Um, here is uh, the build and execution flow um, in, in the OpenMP and offloading session uh, for GCC. We saw also uh, a build and execution flow. This is, this is pretty similar, I would say, at a high level. Um, so we have our source code. This is, I, well, I, I showed a simple example using SQL, but it could be OpenMP as well. Um, um, we, we also support OpenMP actually. The source code contains the computation kernel. We give it to the compiler. The compiler is going to compile um, the host part of the application, the, the, the part of the application that surrounds the kernel. In, in an ordinary way, actually. But then it also takes the kernel and compiles it um, to an intermediate representation called SPIRV. If the programmer passed dash G, it would also produce debug information, again in SPIRV intermediate uh, format. And this, this gives us a binary uh, which contains uh, the intermediate code embedded in it. This is sometimes called the FAT binary. And when this is launched, oh, sorry, when this is launched, um, we get the host process. The host process runs, and at some point, um, it takes the embedded code, the intermediate code, and then it uh, gives it to the device compiler. The device compiler, if we are targeting a C, uh, the CPU, the device compiler would be typically a, a JIT compiler for CPU. But in the case of GPUs, it would, it would be the graphics compiler. And the device compiler produces uh, a proper ELF uh, together with the WARF with it, and then this code is then um, uh, submitted to uh, uh, the target hardware. So, coming back to the original topic, which was about debugging, um, the task of the debugger is now to um, debug actually this code and to map it all the way back to the original kernel. Here is the overall uh, debug architecture. Um, so there is GDB, and GDB can start the host application or it can attach to it if it was already running, and it controls the host application through ptrace. So this is years old, um, uh, pretty standard um, uh, 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 debug architecture here. For those who know, um, GDB terminology, here the host application would be referred to as an inferior, actually inferior one, and it would be uh, placed on top of uh, a native target. What happens next is that the host application runs, it, 
it uses the SQL runtime or OpenMP runtime, and these runtimes have uh, GPU backends. Um, it would be the level zero backend in this, in, in our case, and the level uh, through this um, backend, it would be, I mean, uh, uh, it would be preparing the submission of the workload. And then the debugger comes into uh, the picture here, the, the, the actual GPU debugger. Um, this is an instance of a GDB server. Uh, now GDB server, uh, well, we have uh, written a, a target that's in GDB server that knows and understands uh, the Intel GPU architecture. And it uses level zero debug API um, which is depicted here. And through that, um, it's able to control the GPU uh, uh, and, and, and interact with it um, for its uh, debug events. And finally, this GDB server ZE is connected uh, to GDB, and it, this actually means that now in GDB we have a second inferior which runs uh, which has underneath a remote target. This remote target is not the same as the native target that was for inferior one, and GDB is able to orchestrate these um, actually different targets. That's the multi-target feature of GDB. Credits to Pedro. Um, and we, we rely on that feature. Is the cheating happening at step three or is the jitting happening in this diagram or what? Yes, uh, so in, in the previous slides, I showed the build flow that was based on the JIT model. Here, JIT happens at step three. Yeah, I mean, inside the SQL runtime, yes. Um, but it's also possible to do ahead of time compilation where you can do, you can lower down the intermediate representation sphere view to the actual device code, and that actual device code would be embedded in the FAT binary. But the idea is actually the same. The runtime would then, instead of invoking the, the, the JIT compiler and lowering the intermediate representation to device code, it would immediately load the already compiled device code. Which makes it simpler. It, from little. our point of view, it's the same. I mean, from, from the debugger point of view, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, the level zero debug API contains a bunch of functions. You see, um, I mean, for for execution of the GP, uh, of a GPU workload, there are many more functions. But for the debugging part, these are the uh, functions uh, that are defined in the API. They contain things like being able to attach to a device for debugging uh, as as a tracer. Um, or, or detaching, um, reading and querying uh, for a debug event. Some events require that they need to be acknowledged. Uh, there's a function for acknowledging. Debugger can interrupt a whole device or a subset of threads, um, or it can resume again uh, a, a, a set of threads. It can be an individual thread. Uh, uh, all the threads uh, or a subset, um, read-write memory or uh, peak poke thread state, etc. So these are the functions that the debugger uh, is built up on. Um, we recently submitted a, a series of patches, actually. Um, because we are interested in getting this upstream. Um, what we submitted is a basic um, introduction uh, to a debug capability. Um, in the downstream uh, uh, debugger, there is a lot more, and we are interested in um, keeping the, the, the upstreaming efforts um, and maintaining this. Uh, for instance, what doesn't exist currently, 
in, in the upstream version is SIMD lane aware, awareness. So GDB doesn't know anything about SIMD lanes. And there's actually a buff uh, on the third day, on Monday, um, where this topic would be discussed. So this, um, in, in this talk, um, I would be focusing on this upstream version, not the downstream version. I will try to show you a demo um, as, as a snapshot, as screenshots. But if anyone is, is uh, interested in a live demo, I would be uh, happy to give it during, a, uh, during the break. So the code that we will be using is the vector edition that I showed um, at the beginning. Here's the main. We create a queue. And then for, for, I just print the queue. Um, and then we create three buffers. These are malloced as unified shared memory, which means they would be available at the host and uh, the device memory. Um, with, with, with this uh, unified shared memory, the user doesn't have to explicitly copy data from to GPU memory. This is handled by the runtime. And then we initialize the input arrays, and finally do a parallel for. This is the, the, the process function, and the function is, uh, is given here. What I will do is that I will, ins uh, I will insert a breakpoint uh, inside this kernel, and then we will be stopping inside the GPU. Um, so, Starting from, from the beginning. What the user needs to do is first compile the code, and here I use dash g dash o zero. And then we run the program in GDB. Um, next, we define a breakpoint at a, at a level zero API function, in this case, ZE context create. And this is a function that we know is appropriate for our purposes because it, it's a function that would, that would be invoked after the backend is initialized, but before the workload is actually offloaded. So it gives us a, a very nice moment to attach to GPU uh, as a tracer, as a debugger. And next, um, we need, yeah. Question. Who triggers that? You say that this is not the downstream GDB, right? Correct. This is, this is, this who, would. Who does that T-break? Uh, you I, didn't type it. I do. You, I'm the user, I do. The user does it. I don't see it. Ah, uh -huh. okay. S sorry? Yeah, I was wondering what you typed somewhere T break Z yes. you did it yes. as the end user. Use, yes. So this is Okay, it's okay. Here. As long as there is no magic, it's okay. It um there is a magic too, but I will come to it. But in this version, in the upstream version, the user has to do it manually. Mm -hmm. And then the user needs to do more. Um they need to set target non-stop mode on um, so that both the native target and the remote target are going to operate in non-stop mode. This is necessary because it, the, the, the multi-target feature of GDB um, doesn't have yet support to handle all stop targets and a remote target is by default all stop. Um, and what this setting basically does is that GDB would operate having non-stop targets, but on top of that, it implements the all-stop behavior. And then we run, and then we hit the, the, uh, the breakpoint. This breakpoint is, is uh, we call it as the hook breakpoint because that's the, that's the moment where we are going to um, attach to the GPU. So at this moment, um, the GPU backend has been initialized and um, we are ready to at attach. And if we take a look at the, the overall debug architecture, this is what the, the state is, is like that. Okay. There's one inferior, uh, the, the, the runtime and uh, uh, the level zero backend, 
uh, have been initialized. So now what comes next? Now we need to um, add a new inferior, that's the second inferior, which will represent the GPU. We switch to that second inferior. And if you do an inf info inferior at this point, we see that, hmm, okay, so the first inf inferior is there, it has the native target, the second inferior is null, it's empty. Next, we do the connection. This is a remote connection, and what we connect to is a GDB server ZE instance, and it attaches to GPU for this given PID, and this PID process ID is the process ID of the host process. Another question? Just a quick question. If you have multiple GPUs, are they all going to be under the same inferior, or is that one inferior per device? If we have multiple GP GPUs, like multiple physical PCI yeah, cards, you each, have one inferior each, or each GPU is represented as a separate inferior. Mm -hmm. but what about the idea? Thanks. Um, the the PID, the PID is the same. So there is one. The, okay, there will be multiple inferiors, but one GDB server ZE. The question is. If we have multiple GPUs on the system, how many inferiors do we have um, in GDB? The answer is, well, there would be one GDB server ZE, but that GDB server ZE connects to multiple GPUs. And from GDB, server, GDB server's point of view, it's as if like we have multiple processes on Linux. For instance, the, the Linux target for GDB server is able to handle multiple processes. That's, that's the same idea. Um, each GPU is represented as if like a process inside a single GDB server ZE, and in GDB, there would be multiple inferiors, but they would be using the same connection, the same GDB server ZE connection. Okay, let's continue. And after making this connection, um, we see something here that says unavailable. I will be talking about this a bit more in the upcoming slides. But what this basically means is that we don't have anything on GPU yet. I mean, G GPU is not running anything. And then info inferiors, I mean, just, just for uh, uh, informative purposes. Now info inferior says, okay, inferior one is the native process and inferior two is a remote connection. Um, until we came to this point, there are multiple things that the user had to do like define this temporary breakpoint, the hook breakpoint, um, start GDB server ZE, co connect to it, create the second inferior, etc. In the downstream compiler, we do all these boring things um, using a, a Python script. It, it's, uh, uh, it relies on GDB's Python API, so the user doesn't need to do all these uh, uh, manual things. It happens automatically. Now, as the user, now we can define a breakpoint. Um, here we, I define it. This maps to a line inside the kernel. And actually, as a user, I could have defined the breakpoint right at the beginning. So I, I don't have to wait until this point. And in that case, as, I mean, the, the breakpoint would be defined as a, uh, 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 with, with a location map to the host if there is a mapping, or it could have been defined as a pending breakpoint, but it would immediately get a location inside the GPU code as, long, as soon as the GPU kernel becomes available to the debugger. So the location would be, would be resolved. Um, and then schedule multiple mode of GDB needs to be turned on because there are multiple inferiors now, and uh, it would be more convenient for the user to when they say continue, uh, it would be more co convenient to resume all of them. 
And again, the auto attach script, the Python script that I mentioned, does this um, uh, behind the curtain. And then we resume and hit the breakpoint. The breakpoint hit comes from thread two dot something. Now that we have two inferiors, uh, threads are enumerated with a prefix, and the prefix number here denotes the, the inferior that they belong to. So thread one dot whatever would belong to the host process, and thread two dot whatever belongs to uh, the GPU. Um, what works at this point for the, for the upstream version is you can do backtrace, you can switch threads, you can resume them, you can resume all of them with continue, or you can resume uh, uh, only one of them using the scheduler locking mode. Um, you can step them next uh, or step into, etc. So these things work. What doesn't work is variable values um, would not print um, uh, we see an error. The reason is that these variable values depend on the SIMD lane because the data is vectorized and the compiler says, okay, so the compiler says that the value of this variable depends on the current SIMD lane. And to be able to compute that, it uses a, a new um, dwarf operator push lane uh, which is currently not recognized because it's, it's new. I mean, it doesn't exist in, in the war five. Um, it's not recognized by GDB and also GDB doesn't yet know about lanes. So uh, it wouldn't be able to push the lane. Uh, again, that's, that's a topic of the buff on Monday. There is, um, there is already an upstream version of of a AMD debugger, and I, I believe there's, there's the same problem there. Yeah. Another question? Uh, by the way, uh, can this setup work with like both AMD and Intel GPUs at the same time? Uh, like This debugger, no. Ah. This, yes, no. I mean, it's, suppose these are merged into upstream. In the upstream, there's already some level of debug support uh, for AMD, and then there would be some level of debug support for Intel as well, and then you, you, you would be able to do both. But both um, vendors have their downstream versions, which do a lot more. So they don't cooperate in? Don't cooperate here. The hope is that there will be a consensus and then things will, will be merged. I, uh -huh. That's my hope at least. Uh, we actually have speakers. Huh? Uh, <laughs> I've heard that somewhere. Uh, actually, I think it would work. Like, uh, say, Inferior 1 was an AMD. Uh, a process attached to a AMD GPU, and then you do an add inferior, and then that's a SQL process. Mm -hmm. and then you add a new inferior and connect to GDB server. And I, I, I'm not, you know, except the lane stuff. Just the basics. I think it would. There was. There's nothing that prevents GDB from having one inferior attached to the GDB AMD side and another inferior attached to the. Uh, oh side. yes, b both of them. Okay, I see what you. Mean. Yeah, that's sure. Like there's there's nothing there's no data structure or anything inside GDB that prevents you from at the same time debugging two different vendor cards. It's just that typically you don't have a machine like that. I expect might have. Yeah. I expect you might have a bit more difficulties of being, having both run times on your process using both the GPU than you would have having GDB understand both actually. That's a, that's a different one process, two runtimes. Yes, one process, two runtimes. Two separate processes, each one uses its own runtime. Oh, yeah. Not as interesting. We could do that, but it's yeah. more fun if you have one, one process. Until we, after Monday, maybe we'll come up with some solution. Mm -hmm. 
Could you interpret it in different ways? Like for instance, in the, at the beginning of your uh, talk, you said that SQL could be used to offload work to GPUs from other vendors, uh, let's say AMD. Uh, I don't know if you like your library as like your Z mm -hmm. library yeah. has debug support for GPUs other than Intel, or it's just like other vendors could implement it if they wanted to, but it's not done today. So the back backend, the level zero backend is implemented for Intel GPU only at the moment. But it's, a, it's an API, it's an abstraction. So if there were an implementation, in principle, it should work. Right. But in principle, yeah. <laughs> so the workflow would be like SQL, run, uh, SQL runtime would be, uh, would have like uh, two abstraction layers and it would go into AMD one and into the Intel one to implement uh, offloading to both GPUs. Doesn't it exist today, like a SQL implementation for AMD? Uh, I think it does. So there is at least one. Uh, there is at least one project which is called Heap SQL that will export the SQL API and use Heap, so which is like AMD's framework to access GPU under the hood. I don't. But I guess yeah, that comes with its own runtime, so I don't really know if that's going to work with the same runtime as Intel's. But I think we may be a bit derailing a, yeah, a bit, and I'm sure Boris has a lot more stuff to that, talk us about. Um, but we can come back to that later, I guess. Yeah. I think I, I, I have sufficient time. Yeah. Well, we are the last talk of the day, so we can yeah. run over. That's not an issue. <laughs> um, he, so, Hipstickle, yes, as far as I know, they. They can do. They can handle offloading to, to to AMD GPUs, but the backend is not level zero. It, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. So the level zero backend, which implements the debug API, is really um, Intel GPU specific. Now AMD GPU has, I mean Intel GPU GPUs from a debugger point of view have their own peculiarities. And I believe AMD GPU also has its own other um, interesting features. <laughs> um, how to handle these two things using a single, a if, that, if that was the question, I don't know. I thought that was the question. I, I don't know. That I, I, I don't know how it would be. Yeah, it, in principle, I think it would be possible, but it would be a huge, huge effort and also a very political one, I, I, I fear, yeah. I, I don't have my own that. So. Just for the record, I know someone who did that and that, they're like a proof of concept of one single program that offers, I think, on different GPU vendors and FPGAs and CPU on the same process. So it's been done. I'm not sure there is anything anyone is pushing like that is production ready, ready today. I actually think it will just work. I mean, actually, no. I mean, SQL will not be sitting on for the AMD side. SQL, SQL will be on top of HIP. Uh, so imagine you start with a rock GDB, you're debugging that, you just see your GPU threads as waves and then and then you would create a new inferior and if the process happens to spawn gpu side on the intel gpu it will activate the level zero backend uh, and then you would use udb server to attach to that on a separate inferior and i'm not seeing where's the conflict with different I mean, they, by managing those, by managing to, to, to initialize those two separate targets being connected to two, I mean, co corresponding debug APIs and libraries, um, they would be separate inferiors. And then I, 
Yeah, I believe GDB would be able to orchestrate that. Right. So on, on the on the AMD side, we would not use GDB server. And on the, but on it's Excel a different side, it's a different inferior. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hmm? At this point, it's not. It's an academic question. Yeah. Like at this point, it's like split code bases. So maybe we can ask the question again once they're all upstream or something. But until then, it's just hand waving. It's interesting to me that people think that it's, it wouldn't wouldn't work out of the box, but I actually think it would. Um, if it doesn't work for some reason, I, I would like really why. <laughs> Yeah, and the other okay. At least for the GDB sides, I think both AMD and Intel are both committing on wanting to have things that are going to be compatible and that's going to be working all well, to, uh, you know, well together. Like there is, uh, I think we're both committed to put the work so we can have something that's going to be compatible all the way. For GDB, for the runtime, I have no idea. Okay, going on. Now let's do info threads. There are two inferiors. There are two threads here, one dot something. They are the host threads. And then we see a long list of GPU threads prefixed by, by the inferior number two. In my toy application, Vector Edition, I had a very small data and I was utilizing only a handful of threads. And there are thousands of threads in the GPU, so many of them appear as unavailable. What we do here is we model hardware threads. So right at the beginning, right after attaching to the GPU, um, GDB would show all these hardware threads and this list stays stable. If there is nothing running, or if the thread is idle, then it would appear as unavailable, as shown here. But if it, if it actually stopped at some uh, uh, breakpoint, then we would see its location. Um, so basically, unavailable means that GDB and the debugger, I mean, actually GDB server ZE, tried to interrupt the thread, but it was not possible to interact with it. That's how the hardware works. Um, we decided to model hardware threads in GDB for the following reason. One is that the device thread list stays stable. And we thought that this is, this is nice uh, from, uh, for, for user experience because applications that submit workloads usually have short running but many kernels. So this would cause proliferation of threads. Um, and if enter and exit events of threads were to be defined and received, then they would be really intrusive. Um, when we model hardware threads, one question that comes in, into mind immediately is, so suppose I stopped at a threat, at a breakpoint, um, I do debugging, and then I resume the threat to hit the next breakpoint. Wouldn't it just go somewhere arbitrary? No, that's not the case for our hardware because there is no context switch. Once a thread is assigned to run a kernel with a particular work item ID, it runs it um, until termination. For this reason, um, staying on, I mean, modeling the hardware thread on staying uh, for a, at a particular thread in the context um, doesn't cause problems as it would on, on, a, on a CPU where hardware threads might be switching the context very frequently. And here are um, some, the, another question. 
just a quick question. So does that mean that here um, you have each breakpoint in process, or let's say you have a bigger application, you do continue, and you hit another, another breakpoint, maybe in process or maybe in some other, uh, other function. Do you have any way to know if that's still the same thread that was running, like the, um, the actual uh, the actual instance of a dispatch, or can that be just another another way of coming in and just using uh, reusing the same spot and eating either the same or another uh, another breakpoint? Mm -hmm. um, so suppose we hit a breakpoint with a thread and then we resume it and it hits the breakpoint, let's say again or another breakpoint. How do we know that it's still running inside the same kernel instance? Yes. with the same work item ID. Or is that another one? Yeah, it is possible, I mean, okay, first of all, it's possible that the thread is going to terminate, finish its execution of the kernel, and then it will be assigned another work item ID. It will run the same kernel, but, I mean, as a different yeah. thread, basically. Yeah, but it's possible like with a different ID in the grid, so that's like, in the programming model, that's not the same thread. Mm -hmm. That's it doing the same work on different data. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can check whether you are still in, in the same kernel instance. Um, so in the downstream version, it's possible to print kernel instance IDs. So you can check that. That would be one way to do it. Um, and for the same kernel instance ID, whether you would be getting the uh, getting another work item index, and that's something that you can check by by comparing the value of the work item ID, which is also available. So these are in the downstream compiler, uh, in the sorry, in the downstream debugger. These are available as convenience variables. In the upstream version, they don't exist yet. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Just to give some some information about how the GPU, I mean Intel GPU works, uh, because it, it, uh, this is different from hardware to hardware. Um, here is how how the breakpoint dance uh, is done in all stop mode. For a reminder, let's first check the CPU case to insert a, a breakpoint. Um, what the debugger does is that it makes a copy of the original instruction and then it writes the interrupt instruction in place of that original instruction. And then when, when the breakpoint is hit, it would stop all the threads um, in the process. And then when we want to resume, it um, writes the original instruction back or maybe it, it had already written that uh, uh, um, right after stopping. Um, it then makes the current thread execute that single instruction so that it would be stepping over the breakpoint and then it writes the interrupt again and then it resumes all the threads. On the right hand side, we see this for an Intel GPU. Um, there is no specific breakpoint instruction. Instead, in, in the instruction opcode, there is a bit, a dedicated bit, um, which would set it as a breakpoint. So that particular bit is set in the instruction opcode, which means the original instruction is still there, except for a difference of one bit. And when the breakpoint is hit, um, the debugger stops all the threads, well, all the available threads, some of them may be unavailable, as I, uh, as I explained previously. And then when we are about to resume, um, the debugger doesn't need to do this copy, write, et cetera. Instead, um, in the control register of the thread, there is, a, there is another dedicated bit, which is called breakpoint suppress. The debugger sets that breakpoint suppress bit, and then it resumes um, all the threads. The breakpoint is still inserted, but because of the breakpoint suppress bit, um, the, uh, the thread which was supposed to step over the breakpoint will not stop. It will actually do step over, and it will continue. Question? 
And when is that breakpoint surface bit cleared? Um, do you need to do a single step, then clear it, then? Yes, it, 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 uh, the hardware clears it. OK, after one instruction. One, right. one, one instance, yes. Another question? So this is specific to Intel GPU, Correct. and other GPUs are working another way? Yes. They're yes. very different. <laughs> so could you actually exactly explain what suppress having a suppress bit set when you have a particular bit in the instruction opcode for a breakpoint, what does it mean? What does the GPU in this case will do? Um, so there is an instruction. The instruction has its breakpoint bit set, so which means the thread would normally break, mm -hmm. um, jump to the system routine. But the thre thread, I mean that individual thread, this is a register of the thread, um, has one bit which we can set to yeah. tell the thread when you see the next breakpoint bit, ignore it, mm -hmm. and also clear the breakpoint suppress oh. bit and continue. Oh. So it wouldn't. It would just clear its breakpoint suppress and keep running. That. Um, here is a similar thing in non-stop mode. Um, again, on the left-hand side, this is for CPU. To insert a breakpoint, we again make a, a, a copy of the original instruction and write the interrupt instruction. And then to resume, the debugger writes the original instruction to a well-known area. And then it, I mean, this, this is separate. Uh, from from the from the code that's being executed, and then the thread threads PC is modified so that it would point to that that area, and then it would uh, the thread is made to execute that um, single instruction. Um, this is called the displace stepping mechanism. The, the idea is that to, to um, well in non-stop mode the other threads could still be running and they could still hit the breakpoint, so we cannot, um, uh, um, we cannot remove the breakpoint instruction. And then the PC is set again, and the, resume, uh, uh, the thread is resumed. For the GPU, um, again, inserting a breakpoint means uh, we set a particular bit uh, in the instruction, and resuming means, again, we, we rely on the, uh, the breakpoint suppress bit. So the um, so the flow is, is simpler here. I'm also working on upstream. Your path is having good support. Ah, in up, good question. This was for um, uh, this was for downstream. In the upstream code. Um, Um, the thread would the, the thread would need to step over. Um, like yes, yes. So you don't you don't include support for the magic already in this kind of series. There is no displaced stepping. Um, what we do is you no know, for for resuming we do we do breakpoint suppress. Uh, I assume like in, in, in your downstream you have some kind of target hook or GDB arch hook that says I don't need to do anything special to step over this breakpoint. Mm -hmm. Do you have, don't you have something like that? We, 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 yes, we have GDB arch code which allows us to, um, to actually skip the single stepping, the step over one instruction um, phase. Uh, and direct the resume. In the downstream, there is still that that phase which is redundant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I'm interested in that. Okay. Hook.
I'm just wondering um, because you are always having a bit reserved for all the instruction, and is it not too costly to have this bit uh, like always reserved for something? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Um, that's how it was designed, and apparently the, the hardware architects or, uh, and, and the other people didn't think that it was um, it was an overhead that was significant enough. Yeah. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> but I, I mean, I mm, I don't have more concrete answer. Yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. Uh, so in your example here, you're using universal shared memory, so USM. Um, in GDB, can you access that piece of memory from both inferiors, or do you need to be selecting the one which actually, you know, where the memory is actually allocated? Mm -hmm. Because even if both the host and the device can access this, it's only going to be, you know, physically living in either the host or the GPU. The, the memories are separate, and in GDB, because we have two inferiors, they also have different separate program spaces. Yes, um, but even if you have two program spaces, they're independent, but you have here, uh, like your um, input one, you mm -hmm. get an address. If you read that, like if you do inferior one and you uh, and you read the, the memory of that address, do you see the result? Like, mm -hmm. you could, mm -hmm. from both inferiors, even though there are two addresses, uh, like two distinct address spaces, they could still ally us behind the scene, the, the same memory that's available to both the t CPU side of your application and the GPU side of your application. Mm -hmm. Okay, so suppose we stopped inside GPU. Yes. At the breakpoint, and then we want to access input one. It would go through the level zero API and it would access the GPU memory. Suppose we switch to the host. That's your question. Yes. And then we want to print, and try to print the value at the same address. The same address? No, I don't think it would work. Yes. It's not mapped. Also, yes. Um, no, it is with USM, which is. You don't have to use USM with, with SQL, that's optional. But, but if you use USM, you can use the pointer on both sides. And but that's for the work. I mean, okay, so for the host, if I query input one, it would give me a separate, a, another address, not the same address. Although. But you can know okay. the address and just do a, a cast. Yes, if I use the, the, the hard coded yes. address, from inferior one, I, I don't think it would be accessible. Okay. A related question is, if it is accessible, so you use shared memory, uh, USM is enabled or whatever, causes mm -hmm. it to be mapped on both sides. You could imagine that there are situations where you hit issues with GDP's internal caches, which assume that you don't have such sharing. Uh, you know, there's there's a stack cache, mm -hmm. GB, there's a code cache. Uh, maybe on the stack data cache, you could like, you you inspect it from one end and it goes into the cache. Or you, you well, I guess it's when you modify that there's a problem. You, you modify and it goes, maybe there's no problem, I don't know. Mm. Just I just suspect there's something around here. I mean, how? So I guess the case you want is you're on inferior two, you read the memory, it shows it's all good. You go to inferior one, you modify the same memory, all good. You come back to inferior two and you read again and there are chances that you will eat GDB caches and you won't see the modification that's been done via inferior one. Yes. Okay, so what I believe would work, I, I, may, I might be wrong, 
uh, but based on my inform information, what would happen is that, so suppose you access GP memory from inferior two, and then you go into inferior one, and then you access the memory through the input one variable again, which was the, which was, I mean, which had the address of the CPU copy. What should happen there is that the runtime, that, that's how the runtime implements the, the unified um, shared memory. The page is locked. And when we try to access that page, it should trigger a, um, a single handler. And that the singular, si signal handler copies the data from GPU back to CPU. So we should be able to access a copy, but the same data. And then if you go back to GPU. But that's, that's one time, like the user. But, but this is. User space signal, that's what you mean? Or is it like kernel level? So it's an interrupt, not. It, it, uh, it, it is, okay, so it is passed to the user space. It is passed to the user space. It, it, and, and, G, and GDB can actually, okay, so GDB can actually um, receive, it would receive that, that signal and GDB would have to send it back to the application so that the migration of the page would happen. But it's all stopped at that point. You're just printing, so you're just ac accessing memory using uh, slash that's proc a correct, PID. Yes, memory. that's a good point, yes. So the signal, the if signal then be, would not be delivered. It would be, yes. yeah. That, that's, this is, maybe in practice it's not a problem, mm -hmm. but maybe it is at some real bizarre, difficult to mm. reproduce problem. Um, it's a consequence of having two inferiors yeah. when you have mm. one address space. And there's a workaround that I've seen being used in sports that did something similar enough, mm -hmm. which is just to disable caching. There's a command for that. It would be another command to put in, in your Python code. Okay. Uh, I don't recall it's main set cache off or some code cache and stack cache off. Okay. Another question? Kind of an unrelated question, but uh, are CMD lanes uh, in the downstream uh, GDB, are the CMD lanes uh, supported from the Python scripts point of view? No, they are built in GDB. So uh, if I wanted to like run a Python script that would like query uh, the state of the CMD lanes, it won't, I, I won't be able to do anything. Hmm. We, okay, um, we didn't make um, lanes uh, available through the Python API. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. that, that, that availability doesn't exist. Uh -huh. So um, in the, this is a screenshot of the downstream debugger, just to give you an example. So we, that, that's the last slide. Um, thank you for your patience. So we define a breakpoint and then we run what happens is that we go and hit the breakpoint. So all this stuff about creating the second inferior, connecting it, etc., is done by, by the Python script. And this line here, which says Intel GT, GDB server is started, etc., that's, that's what, what uh, the auto attach script prints here for information purposes. And then um, there is there's support for uh, SIMD lanes. Here it says uh, um, we switch to SIMD lane zero. Threads are printed together with their um, uh, with their active lanes, um, and then variables are printed properly uh, because there is there is awareness of lanes and there is support for for that push lane dwarf operator. Um, there are some extensions and new uh, comments to improve user experience. Like for instance, there's, there's this stopped flag uh, with which you can filter out unavailable threads and you get a more concise, um, shorter thread list. But in, in real applications, I guess 
all the threads would be utilized. I mean, why, why do people pay for GPUs? Um, but you would still get um, thousands of threads. Another, there is another question. So in the previous screenshot, the one that's upstream, each thread had a certain number of lanes in it, just we cannot see them and trick with them. And Correct. now we would see the same number of threads, assuming you would show them yes. all, but we can see the lanes. Yes, okay. correct. Th this is the same application, yes. Mm. I'm, the, the design choice of, you look at the GPU threads as the, like a the fixed number of those threads. This, this means that when you attach, you always see uh, the number of threads you see is always the same. It's all, always the, the number of hardware compute units you have, right? Yes, the, the number of available hardware threads is always the same. Always the same. Mm -hmm. So does, do, doesn't this mean that you can only ever have one process being debugged in the system at one time? Like you cannot have one SQL process only using half of the resources of the GPU and debugging that, and then another user uh, on the same machine is, or another process is using some other compute resources at the same time, you cannot debug that at the same time, because... Correct, there is, yes, there is, there is this mode called run alone. Um, if one user is using the GPU for debug purposes, another user won't be able to I mean, they would have, they can submit, but the submitted workload would have to wait until this debug session uh, finishes. Right. So it's they cannot, another GPU can be used, but the same GPU cannot be shared between two right. processes. That is like, I'm looking at this and thinking, the design choice you've made constrains you this, here. Okay, this is a constraint coming from the hardware. Not not top down. It's okay. bottom up. Current hardware. If this ever changes, yeah. then you'd have to change your design. So, are you like saying that this will never be supported? No, we are not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, I, I know from the experience. Yes. On other hardware, that there is there was that constraint, and then it, there wasn't. Yes, there is there is work, but I cannot say when. I mean, in how much time this would be available, but yes, there is, there is work. Um, what would happen in that case is that the two users would still see, like they would see half of the threads would be available, but they can filter them out using the flex. That's the idea. Or you could do how the AMD guys do. <laughs> <laughs> which is basically there's a logical thread ID. It's not the physical core number. Mm -hmm. So if your process spawns a number of kernels uh, using a number of waves, your, your, your kernel spawns enough hip threads to consume four waves, you just see four waves when you're debugging. And mm -hmm. a different process at the same time, time can be spawning 10 kernels uh, each consuming 10 waves, and when debugging that, you'd see 100 waves. And the, because there's this logical mm -hmm. mapping between thread ID and, you know. What happens when, I mean, I, I, I don't know, and I, I'm, I'm curious, what happens when the same process runs another kernel? Do the thread list get updated? Yes, you'll see more waves. Yes. In, in our opinion, I, I think uh, Simone has a, has a comment, but doesn't this cause too much threads appearing and disappearing? We disable the notifi notification. The, when GDB detects a new thread upstream, it always prints, uh, by default, it prints new thread appear, or new thread disappear. No, no, we but if I, if I put break, uh, kernel one, kernel two, I have a breakpoint here in the common path, I have a breakpoint here in the common path. Yeah, I'm sorry, you lost me. Can you say it? So, suppose all the threads hit a breakpoint in my kernel one, 
So I wouldn't I see thousands of threads? You would, yes. And then I resume. Mm -hmm. I delete the breakpoint, I resume, and then thousands of threads hit the second breakpoint in yes. the second kernel. Do I see another, a new set of thousands of threads? Yes. Um, That's what we thought would be it's the proliferation same. of threads. Right. It's it's the same exact the exact same thing you see on the CPU side, of course, in a mm -hmm. bigger scale. But it's just it's it's a different kernel. It's a different invocation. Mm -hmm. It's this in this this patch. So logically, it's a different thread. Okay. So I mean, I will make a claim, but it's yeah. I mean. The, yeah, I see what it's you're saying. It's the, on the CPU side, I would think that applications don't create and I mean start and kill threads so often. Instead, they would create a, a pool of threads and that they would assign tasks to them, so that even from the software thread point of view, they the number usually stays stable. I would think so. It's a question of, is that so important compared to then having this concept of unavailable threads and this issue with multiple debugging multiple mm -hmm. processes at the same time? These problems only appear because of this design choice. That's what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. on, on the AMD side, we just weighed and that was not enough of a problem, the number thing. Um, yeah. You know, different design choices, but I'm just mm -hmm. suggesting that this design choice, you know, uh, may cause problems in the future, eventually, when you will need to support uh, multiple debugging at the same time. So. Do we see? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, sorry. <laughs> <Just>. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess those are, you had a slide where you said we didn't choose to model logical threads because there would be too much uh, notifications or things like that, uh, like thread creation or some. To, to, so you can come back to, I don't know. Yeah, uh, would cause proliferation and, and like, like yeah, somehow with the MD port, we don't see that. I was wondering why. But uh, when threads get created, and like when they are created and exit and nothing happened, GB doesn't report them. So even if thousands of waves get created I'm, and, sorry, I'm, and, and exit, yeah, it, it's, not, it's not like it prints a flood of, of notifications. In, yes, uh, it so can be. If, if that scenario of the numbers keep incrementing very quickly only yeah. happens if say you have a breakpoint that triggers on all the kernels and then you resume execution and uh, a bunch of new kernels are spawned and they also hit a breakpoint. Mm -hmm. Because if, if there's no breakpoint hit for a while and new kernels are constantly being spawned and, and they die, those new threads come and go and GDB doesn't see them. So no number is incremented. Yeah. I, I, so I in mean, practice, I'm... it really doesn't happen. Mm -hmm that much yeah we thought that we thought in in practice it would matter i guess it's uh, yeah yeah fight thank you